Hello, I'm Fred Opie. Welcome to this food prop production download of Breaking Bread. For fees, terms, and conditions of use to rebroadcast and or reproduce Breaking Bread podcast in part or whole, contact Food Prop Productions at www.fredopie.com. Now on to the podcast. Well, Zora, Zora Neale Hurston was born in 18, uh, 1891 in Alabama. And she grew up in a small town founded in 1877 in Eatonville, Florida. Now, Hurston does not even tell you that she's born in Alabama when you read her own work. She, she has you believe she's uh, from Florida, but she actually was born in Alabama, so were both her parents. Hurston remained in Eatonville, the oldest old black township in the United States, until about 1917. Hurston would go on to graduate from Barnard College in New York and begin a career as an anthropologist doing field work. My new research delves into food ways through the lens of Hurston's work. The book considers topics such as food and religion, food and race relations, special occasions, and collective community food events such as hog killing days, which would happen right around this time of the year, fish fries, barbecues, and cakewalk contests, as well as related recipes. Let's, let's take a look at how Hurston's observation in her native Eatonville, other rural communities, and work camps captures the courtship rituals and sexual foreplay among Southern African Americans in the 1920s, 1930s. I argue that, as with politicians who ritually do stumping and eating events in which they treat voters to free refreshments to court voters, similarly, men and women have used food and drink to court sexual partners and or spouses. In short, I argue that, as in politics, in the pursuit of sex and or courtship, there is no free lunch. <laughs> Secondly, building on the work of Hazia Diner at NYU and her book, Hungering for America on Italian, Irish, and Jewish Foodways, I argue that both food, common sex, and courtship strengthen bonds between group members and create barriers to intersections with outsiders. That is, generally speaking, the same people we do not eat with or consider eating their food are the same people we, do, we avoid courting because, like sex, food increases group identity. Then again, when you look at a place like Eatonville, there is a much more rigid a ritual for what's acceptable and unacceptable as far as courtship and sexual activity. So although constantly tested and probed, elders, religious leaders, and spouses expected and policed these traditions of a ritual, uh, uh, these traditions and courtships of uh, sex between married people. So the understanding when you're in a township, a fully developed township with a religious structure, is that sex is to be within marriage. But it doesn't mean that these are not constantly contested, as James Scott would say. But how they played out before and after marriage makes for some interesting storytelling. These stories suggest different gender and urban and rural views about food, sex, and courtship and how people negotiated them all. So I'm going to take a look at this, uh, this antidote from Hearst's work. And the, the key thing that you see here, this is from um, uh, one of her novels, uh, and you may recognize the characters in it. Is here's a here's a, a group of men in front of uh, uh, Joe Clark's store, and uh, here comes the girl in the town that all the young men are very interested in. Her name is Daisy, and so here's the scene where Daisy comes down, and, and these guys are trying to get Daisy, Daisy's interest. Are trying to court Daisy. Jim Weston has secretly borrowed a dime, and soon he was loudly beseeching Daisy to have a treat on him. Finally, he can finally she consented to take a quote pickled pig feet on him. Now again, these, these may seem a little weird to us when we're thinking about Valentine's Day and anybody's scrambling. I'm in CVS the other day with my children to buy a card for, uh, for my wife and their mother. And you know, the, the, the aisle where there is candy is in disarray. So nobody, nobody's there looking for pickled pig feet you know, for, for a Valentine's present. But back then, this is one of the things that you would see. I, and I actually I have a, a picture of what you would have seen at Joe Clark's store. Again, this is Zora doing her kind of field work. But if you look at what that pickle, this is what you would have seen. Okay? That's, that's what we're talking about, pickled pig's feet. So most people uh, that had a country store, and even up until the 1960s, 1970s, many, many stores in the South, uh, including bars, would have these big old jars of pickled pig's feet sitting up on the counter. And then you would have the, you know, the tool to be able to take it out, and you would pay 25 cents, whatever it is. So again, this is an old continuation of what people ate during the period of the antebellum period, when you had to survive on what, what existed. So things like pickled pig's feet became one of these things that you used to actually court a girl instead of uh, Valentine's chocolate. 
So I think that's you know, kind of interesting. Now, another one that's, that comes up, and you see this in um, persons play Color Struck, and some of you may, may, or may or may not be familiar with it, but it's, it's a description of uh, a, a group of young people who go out for a park, and they all have baskets of food, and they, un they unpack the basket of food. And one of the things that you see the young man offer to the lady is a chicken wing. And it seemed really strange to me, and I saw it someplace else that Hurst didn't, uh, where she kind of observed this in the field, and then she, what she does is she takes it and she employs it within her own work and in this particular play. So I came across these two courting references in Hurst's work on a preference for the chicken wing. Over other parts in a batch of fried chicken. So here's this whole batch of fried chicken, yet which part does, does this person take out and, and offer to the person that he's romantically interested in? It's a chicken wing. One sees southern black men in Florida offering a chicken wing as a way of indicating the romantic interest and desire to court someone. I wondered about the significance of this African folklore and the belief that souls fly back to Africa after one dies in the Americas. Some of you may be familiar with this. Particularly enslaved Africans held this belief throughout the diaspora. For example, if you're familiar with uh, Julie Dash's work, Daughters of the Dust, she talks about this, about flying back to Africa. During field work in the Caribbean, Hurston also found the common belief that, quote, once Africans, could, once at one time, Africans could all fly. Many of them were brought to Jamaica to be slaves, but they never were slaves. They flew back to Africa. She has, she also says, though, which is kind of interesting, this is another thing I'm going to be covering in the book, is what happens when, when you consume too much salt. It says it inhibits your ability to fly, which is a very interesting concept. And you see salt throughout. Uh, her, her work. So that's actually going to be one of the chapters in the book. So she says, those who ate salt did not have the ability to leave Jamaica and return to Africa. So there's something very symbolic about the salt. There's very, something very symbolic about the chicken. Let's continue with that. So it became one of these things that if you ate salt, you were too heavy to fly. Then I have this source from Mon Mongo Park, and it's, it's called Travels in the Interior Districts of Africa, uh, performed, and it's a 1700 source. I used it in my book, Hag and Hamni, for the first chapter on what goes on in West and Central Africa. And this is what, what Park observed. He says that near the Gambia River region, West Africans held the practice, listen carefully, held the practice of cooking guinea fowls, partridges, and pigeons. But in the process of hunting or trapping them, they never struck the broke or broke the wing of the animal. So again, there's something there where there's a symbolic view of the wing, and when you're trying to court somebody, you give them your best you offer them the chicken wing. I thought, I thought that was interesting. Not really sure where it goes, but I want to put it out there, and hopefully when we discuss this as a group that somebody will have some insights to this. Another one that you see as far as food, key foods and courting and Hurston's work is peanuts and sugar cane. And this is an hilarious story about uh, Hurston's own Uncle Jim. This is her, her father's brother. And this is Eatonville, roughly probably around 1910, that this happens. It's just as the sun, set, just as the sun was setting, one evening around 1910, Jordan Hurston's Uncle Jim, her father's brother, went out across the orange grove down to Joe Clark's general store. Here's that general store again. To purchase, this is what he purchases, a quart of peanuts and two stalks of sugar cane. But why? On his way to a romantic interlude with a woman at a little house in the woods where there lived a certain transient light of love. Hurston's Aunt Caroline... Jim's wife, Hurston's Aunt Caroline, saw him sneak off and kept right on ironing until, she got, uh, until he got as far as the store. Then she slipped on her shoes and went out. You know it's going to get juicy, right? Then she slipped on her shoes and went out in the yard and got the axe, slung it across her shoulder, and went walking very slowly behind Uncle Jim. Then the men on the store porch had given Uncle Jim a laughing send-off as he went to this romantic interlude. They all knew where he was going and why. The food had been brought right there at the store. No chance to warn Uncle Jim of the coming of Caroline, his wife. Nobody expected murder, but they knew that plenty of trouble was on the way. So they sat and waited, and about an hour later, when it was almost black dark, they saw a figure in a white and white dodging from tree to tree until it hopped over Clark's strawberry patch fence and headed towards Uncle Jim's house until it disappeared. 
Look mighty like a man in long drawers and nothing else, Walter Thompson observed. Next, Aunt Caroline emerged from the blackness and passed the store. The axe was still over her shoulder, but now it was draped with Uncle Jim's pants, shirt, and coat, and two stalks of sugar cane were over her sh other shoulder. All she said was, good evening, gentlemen, and kept right on walking towards home. The porch rocked with laughter, and later on, when they asked Uncle Jim how Caroline managed to get into the lady's house, he smiled sourly and said, that axe was her key. When they kept on teasing him, he said, oh, that stubborn woman I married, she, you can't teach her nothing. Can't teach her no city ways at all. So this whole, this whole idea of courtship that within marriage, a city way is that you can have, as they say in Latin America, like Casa Chiquita on the side, a little small house where you keep your woman on the other side of town. So that's what he was doing, but he couldn't get his wife to buy into that. She was resisting this courtship. Now we have another example from this, and this involves another uh, a couple of foods. You'll see some repetition in the foods. One is chicken per league, which I guess is a, a, a specialty because I found it in WPA sources on Florida. Baked chicken. Fried chicken and rabbit, fried rabbit. And by the way, let's show you a picture of that so you can see. So these are the items we're talking about at this other event. Again, think about this food section courting. We also see at the same event, chitlings. Everybody here know what chitlings are? We're together. No, okay. Thank you for being honest. There are some other folks in here who do not know but don't want to say anything like my students. All right. Chitlings are the pig intestines which are cleaned out thoroughly in more modern times, as my grandparents would do, used with a water hose to clean them out. And then you, most of the time, you, you cook them down forever, and you stay out of the house when they're being cooked, by the way. And then usually cooked with uh, a lot of pepper, cayenne pepper, and a lot of vinegar, vinegar in them. So this has become, it, it's become a delicacy. Matter of fact, you can go to many white tablecloth restaurants now and pay a whole lot of money for chitlins. At one time, they were discarded by butchers and People would come and take them and, and, and make food. So again, chitlins have become one of these things that are used in the process of uh, events where courting and sexual interlude is going on. So you have chitlins, peanuts show up again. Again, peanuts, goobers, one of these African plants. And then you had drinkables, many different types of drinks. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, this is an observation that uh, Hurston makes doing field work in a place called Woodbridge, Florida. And this is the first time I ever, ever came across this expression. And she's going to what is known as a toe party. Does anybody recognize at all what a toe party is? Good. All right. So I got some new information for you. It says, let's go to Woodbridge. Great toe party going on. All kinds of refreshments. Woodbridge, Hurston writes, is a Negro community. Say, what is a toe party? She says to the woman and invites her. I asked one of the girls. Well, they hide all the girls behind a curtain. And you stick out your toe. Some places you take off your shoes, and some places you keep them on. But most of the time, you keep them on. And when all the toes is lined up behind the curtain, sticking out from behind it, then the men folks in there looks over all the toes and buys one. They buy it for a dime. And then they get to treat the lady that owns that toe to everything she wants. For example, there was plenty of chicken at this toe party. The baked chicken, the fried chicken, the fried rabbit, the pig feet, the chilling, all these are things plus drinks that you would see at this. So one man says, who obviously purchased Zora's toe, come on, Zora, and have a treat on me, Charlie Jones insisted. You done ate chicken and ham with every shack leg in Orange County but me. Come on and spend some, some, some come on and spend some of my money. Thanks, Charlie, but I get but I got five helpings of chicken inside already, inside of her stomach. And either I got to get another stomach or quit eating. So again, these are one of these common things that you see at the toe party. It's one of these kind of courting events. So now let's turn to work camps. All right, so I, I tried to show courting and eating and sexual interlude that happens within townships, very traditional black communities, black townships, like Eatonville. Now I want to turn the scene to what happens when you look at the same thing at work camps. Now, this is kind of interesting when you think about what's happening lately with, uh, the, with uh, states like Alabama passing, passing immigration laws, which have effectively driven out immigrants to work in the agricultural uh, industry, particularly picking things like tomatoes. And it's, very, it's also extremely interesting to look at who is doing that agricultural work, tomato picking, orange picking, grapefruit picking, peach picking, peanut picking throughout the South, 
during the 1920s, 1930s, it's African Americans. It's people from the Caribbean, different parts of the Caribbean. So I, I, know, I want you to think about this in that perspective. So now let's turn to the work hands. Before the days of E-Verify, everybody knows what E-Verify is, which is one of these laws that are, are requiring uh, um, employers in states like Alabama, Louisiana, some other states to verify that the person that you are hiring actually is a U.S. citizen, so not an undocumented person. So I say, before the days of E-Verify, work camps were places which Hurston describes as having plenty of men and women who are fugitives from justice. Working for employers desperate for hired help and therefore ask no questions about a person's past if they can do the work. As people with criminal, as people with criminal records, work camps and agricultural labor provided job opportunities that legitimate businesses and or employers in their home region would not offer them. The labor market in these places remained good because whites refused to do them. It's very similar to what we're talking about now. We're talking about agricultural work now. The problem is when the state of Alabama passed these laws, literally overnight, many uh, farmers lost their whole entire work group. So they increased the wages to, say, you know, $15, $20 an hour, and they, get, and they get some white Americans, some black Americans to come and do the work. They last half a day, some a day, some a couple hours because the work is so hard. It's the same thing you see in these work camps. You're talking about uh, work camps where you cannot get regular people to do these work. Particularly, they were considered black jobs, black working class jobs. All right, so whites refused to do this, and it became the opportunity for these people to come from many parts, as far away as Georgia, South Carolina, to different parts of Florida to work uh, in, in these di different industries. In the 1920s, 1930s, black laborers in these places also had a greater degree of freedom from the societal norms than in black communities like Eatonville. Again, I'm talking about those norms about sexual rituals, about rituals of courtship. Very different from these situations. So there's the autonomy that's there, but there's also the, the coercive labor that happens in many of these camps, where once you enter these camps, you're essentially, essentially working in a debt peanut situation where you cannot leave. These are also camps where law enforcement people refuse to go. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like living in a penal colony like show sake redemption type of, uh, of existence for any of these workers. But at the other side, they do create some autonomy of their own, and they do this in different spaces that I'll talk about. So in the 1920s, large numbers of black male and female migrants from across the South had settled in work camps and groves in Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and Louisiana. Hurston shows that, that on paydays, laborers commonly organized guitar, guitar music outdoor dances lit with huge bonfires made with faulty logs and slabs of wood. Again, this is the, what you see particularly in the sawmill camps. So if there was wood that couldn't be used and sold, they would take the wood and they would make bonfires, and that's how, they would, that's how they'd have their outdoor fires, which reminds similarly what happened in, in rice culture during the antebellum period. The rice that was cracked rice is the rice that was given to slaves as rations. So again, they have access to some of these things that they're working with. So on payday, they would make these bonfires out of faulted woods and slabs of wood outside their sleeping quarters. Men and women danced. These are the interesting dances. I know some people may be into dancing. Patrick, I know you'll appreciate this. Men and women dance the buck, the belly rub, the whole square dances, and became drunk on moonshine. Like, I'm, I'm quoting, so you know this is not me. Moonshine called coon dip. Popular in Polk County, Florida, made out of grape juice, cornmeal, mash, beef bones, and a few more things. So these are the kind of things that these, these folks are doing, all right? Workers also feasted on outdoor parties on part, parched peanuts. Again, peanuts come up. Fried rabbit comes up again. Fish, fish fry, chicken, and chitlings. Again, these are all things that you see. And typically, what you would see historically is that these are what we call special occasion foods. And these are foods that people during the antebellum period cooked only on Sunday or on holidays. On Sunday was the only day during the week that they had off. On holidays, the only time they had to make this. So that's the only time people were, 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 were preparing these kind of things. The other thing that, you, uh, that I find interesting when you think about this food, this is special occasion food that these folks are eating. But the problem we have now, we talk about issues of obesity, is that we have particularly people of African descent, or Southerners in general because they're eating the same food, is that they're consuming special occasion food every single day. So it's not on these, not on these special occasions that you see here, it's every single day. Or as one person I interviewed for my book is they're sitting in the Eaton Gobble Lane, otherwise known as the fast food lane, and they're consuming fried chicken on a daily basis or sometimes twice a day. 
All right, so these are the kind of things that they're consuming. Considering such evidence through the lens of food history, I argue that sexual dances with someone who could juke to jazz, meaning shake like jelly all over and be broad, this is, again, this is the description, drink copious amounts of moonshine and still hold their liquor, enjoy good food and satisfy one's sexual urges, represented one of the many indicators of group identity among black working class migrant laborers in the 1920s, 1930s in these camps. Now, my, my second book on Guatemala, I'm looking at black laborers who come from the southern United States. Many of them come from the same area. They come from Florida. They, they come out of the port of Mobile, Alabama. They come out of the port of uh, Galveston, Texas. And then many of them come from the Caribbean, different parts of the Caribbean. And I saw the same type of leisure culture, juke joints set up and jazz played on the Caribbean coast of Guatemala. But if you look throughout the Caribbean coast of Central America, that's where United Fruit Company of Boston actually established their plantations. So these were workers who, at the turn of the century, went first as railroad workers to establish the infrastructure for the banana industry. That is, when you set up a, b a banana plantation, you have to have railroads to be able to ship the bananas to the port and then uh, put them on boats that would eventually land in New Orleans. So during their leisure time, I saw some of the same type of heavy drinking, uh, juke joints, jazz, and, and, and sexual uh, kind of tension going on even there. And it's the same time period. So, you know, that book covers the turn of the century, 1880 to about uh, the time of the Depression. So I, I, I found it extremely interesting that before I started research on this project, in many ways I was prepped to do some of the work because of that previous uh, research I did on these folks in, in Central America. So again, these are kind of things we see. Now, my, again, one of the things that, that I show is that when you look at the courtship that goes on, a critical aspect in space, one thing is the outdoor parties we describe with the bonfire, bonfires. But the other critical space to talk about is the juke joint. Okay, sometimes spelled juke joint, J-U-K-E, sometimes J-O-O-K, juke joints. Like the outdoor parties for black working class migrant groups, juke joints served as a social outlet and getaway and havens for employers. These, these function as what I call entertainment maroons that provided escape from the harsh realities of work in the sawmill mining camps, tur turpentine camps, and the agricultural industries. Now, what's interesting, too, is the root of this. Enslaved Africans from the Wolof region of Africa, let me give you guys a slide so you can see what I'm talking about. Enslaved Africans from the Wolof or the Senegal or Gambia uh, region, also the region of modern-day Mali, those empires introduced the term juke, sometimes spelled, as I said, juke, J-U-K-E or J-L-O-K. Listen carefully, meaning, and again, in these cultures, these West African cultures, meaning wicked or disorderly to the colonial, to the colonial South. So they introduced these terms during the Af Af African slave trade when they arrived in the colonial South. So again, these are terms for them meant wicked or disorderly. And wall up the word dizug, spelled D-Z-U-G, and bombada, it is dizuga, which is D-Z-U-G-U. -U. Over time, Africans used the term to describe wicked places or moves, like dances, like the ones I talked about. Okay, so that's where the term juke actually came from. As southern blacks linked juke with shacks, horses, houses, barns, and makeshift nightclubs and dances, it became closely associated with more formal structures serving liquor, food, like I talked about, and producing live or recorded dance music. Recorded music, they said, came from a juke or juke box. So that's where that term actually comes from. Southern African Americans also coined the term honky tonk, which literally meant a segregated white shack or juke joint where rural whites drank similar liquor but listened to country music instead of African American jazz. So again, that's where these two terms from, juke joint and honky tonk. That's where they come from, from actually West African culture dating all the way back to the antebellum period. In contrast to juke joints and honky tonks, rum stops had Caribbean rather than U.S. Southern antecedents. They are, there are other differences as well between these three alcohol-driven institutions. Again, honky-tonks, juke joints, and then rum shacks from the Caribbean. Anthropologist Peter J. Wilson tells us that historically rum shops, rum sh shops like Guatemalan taverns, Argentinian pupurias, served as places for male socializing and refuge from women. Wilson insists rum shops were spaces where men gathered and women entered only in the case of emergency and at the risk of embarrassment to themselves. 
Similarly, historian Frederick H. Smith maintains that the Caribbean rum shop served as a male sanctuary, as male sanctuaries where men sought resolve to resolve the problem that they encountered with women at home and on the job. What is most useful is understanding the role that juke joints have historically played in the construction of working class rituals among southern born African Americans in places like Florida, Louisiana, and Alabama. In these places, black migrants developed a common working class identity rooted in a shared courtship language and musical as well as culinary experience. As I show in my work, uh, uh, in my work on railroad camps, United Fruit Company enclaves in the Caribbean coast of Guatemala, and Herson found in her own study, the consumption of moonshine was widespread and the enormous amounts of alcohol available contributed to the culture of excessive drinking in these areas, again, in the south as well as we see in the Caribbean. It also contributed to violence between workers in romantic relationships. Although work camps and plantations became the site of largely male African-American enclaves, cultural identities cut across gender with migrant women participating in similar pursuits of pleasure. Historian Pete Daniels, who, teaches, who works at the Smithsonian, describes this kind of pleasure-seeking cultural practice by working class, migrant, single men, and women as low-down culture. These men and women entered work camps and groves in search of housing and employment and plenty of time for low-down culture, which became synonymous with drinking, gambling, eating, special occasion food, and sexual activity. Hurston's description of a juke joint in Polk County, Florida, where she writes, the water tastes like cherry wine. Again, Polk County, one of the first places that she actually did field work, is a case in point. Quote, it was a sawmill juke joint in Polk County where I almost got cut to death by Lucy, the girlfriend of Slim, for whom I was collecting songs, writes Hurston. Slim used to be her man uh, back up in West Florida before he ran off to her. Hurston goes on to explain more about this important working class black leisure space. Again, jukes. She writes, jukes is the word for a Negro pleasure house where the men and women dance, drink, and gamble. Often it is a combination of all of these. In past generations, the music was furnished by boxes, another word for guitars, which provided excellent dance music. Later, pianos took the place of the boxes, and now player pianos or victrolas are all in all, or in all jukes. She goes on to say, musically, quote, the juke is the most important place in America because it's the birthplace of blues on which jazz developed. The Negro dances circulated all the world where, where we are, the Negro dances which have circulated all the world were conceived in the jukes. They are slow and sensuous, she writes, and a tremendous sex stimulation is gained from this. But who's trying to avoid it? The man, the woman, the time, the place, they all are there, the music and the juke. In order to juke, a woman must have, as I said here before, a belly wobble. I guess I'm, I'm quoting, uh, you know, this is interesting because my wife does work on, um, on identity, hair and identity. She does things on body image and identity and her own work and how that affects one in, in the work world. That is, what gives one the ability to feel belonged or ostracized based on their hair or other parts. So look at this whole idea when we think about 2000 and, and, uh, 2013 and identities of, of women as, as, as these very thin figures. This is what she says, which is desirable in the jukes. In order, in order to juke, a woman must have uh, a good belly wobble and her hips must be, to the quote of Papa Work Song, shake like jelly all over and be broad. It's a very different image of women that you see in jukes from what we see now in 2013. In addition to good music and sensual dance, and Hurston observes that one could purchase drinks, parched peanuts again, fried rabbit, and other similar southern foods, and work camps. The majority of them spent many leisure hours in juke joints like the one Hurston described above. As mentioned earlier, juke joints served as social outlets and entertainment maroons that allowed men and women to escape, relax, and court. Drinking and courting that happened in juke joints provided a temporary relief from social inequalities, which probably hindered organized efforts to resist labor exploitation. So again, there's one thing to talk about these and celebrate them as uh, harbingers or incubators for jazz and dance and all other kind of things, but they also had uh, uh, the other effect, which is that they prevented people from organizing uh, issues of labor exploitation because they were spending so much time uh, you know, partying in these juke joints and involved in all kinds of sexual es escapades. 
So several scholars have discussed the meaning of excessive drinking. Smith, for example, argues that poor working and living conditions, frustrations, anxieties, and lack of, of occupational fulfillment led to excessive drinking in the Caribbean. Historian, historian Ronald Takaki interprets excessive drinking among Asian immigrants, workers on the plantations, and these are mostly pineapple plantations, sugar plantations in Hawaii, around the same time as this study. He argues that excessive drinking enabled immigrant workers to escape the reality of years of separation from family and community. Similarly, this is what I argue with these two, uh, these two scholars' findings, this is Smith and Takaki. I argue that similarly, the overconsumption of alcohol, rich food, and excessive and risky sexual activity should be interpreted as a coping device and source of temporary relief from stress. One sees similar trends in Hurston's observations in rural communities, as well as among laborers in sawmill, phosphate, and other type of work environments. In conclusion, I argue that as with politicians who ritually do stumping and eating events in which they purchase refreshments to court voters, similarly, men and women have used food and drink to court people and initiate romantic and sexual activity. In short, as in politics, so in romance, again, there is no free lunch. Secondly, I argue that the breaking of bread with people strengthens connections, friendships, and unity. The giving and receiving of food leads to intimacy, and the receiver often feels an obligation to reciprocate, many times sexually, or sometimes sexually. Food can create barriers to relationships with strangers. And finally, we learn from Hurston's observations that more often than not, sex and courting begins with eating and we don't have sex with or court or be receptive to the advances of people whose food we would never eat. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to have some microphones going around. Uh, I do want to play, uh, you, you want to answer a question? No, go for I do want to play, play one more uh, oh, yeah. recording from Hurston so you can get an idea of how she actually went about recording and learning about some of these different things. Can you go for the coast? Uh, I don't remember. I was in a big crowd. I learned in the evening during the crowd. And I just don't have the exact remember who I who did teach it to me. But I learned it from the crowd. Which is Dr. Wilson Martin. You may leave and go to heaven back. This is a, a, a song that she recorded or learned uh, at the work camp in Polk County where she almost got killed. And again, what her strategy was is that she would um, find the person who typically was hired to play at these outdoor events or in these juke joints because typically the musicians were the best storytellers. And she would curry favor with them and then learn as many stories as possible. Now, that's all good and well, but if the girlfriend is there, and doesn't know that this is anthropologist here doing field work, she thinks it's just another quote unquote hoe trying to get her man. And so this is a, a description of the place where she is. And I want you to listen carefully to the, to the song. This is a song about um, the, the person who has a job of waking up the workers every day. And she, Zora talks about hearing this early in the morning, and this person going around singing the song. In all the big work camps, sawmills, and Town Steel, and road camps, and whatnot, they have a man to go around and wake up the camp. And he has various chance and how to wake him up, and sometimes he makes him up as he goes along. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I heard these at Logan, a big sawmill down in Cape Coke County. Come on, let's get some trouble with the walker. Come on. Wake up, David. 
to keep that one on a, on a disc on my recorder and use it to wake up my 10 and 7 year old every morning. That would be perfect and I would provide it for anybody who has children who have a problem getting up in the morning. 